J.K. Rowling creates a similarly appealing boarding school community in the Harry Potter books with the added excitement of magic. Harry, Hermione, Ron, Neville and all the others may have special powers, but at Hogwarts School of Wizardry and Witch Witchcraft and Wizardry, they have to attend lessons and play team sports and learn the values of loyalty and friendship in ways recognisable from the earlier story. And if the chalet girls always seem to be eating delicious food from the kitchens and of the school and Tyrolean cafes, then Harry and his pals are endlessly tucking into cauldron cakes, chocolate frogs, Bertie Bot's every flavour beans, not to mention enormous meals of steak and kidney pudding and roast beef. Detailed descriptions of food is a regular feature of children's books and contribute greatly to the connection between the book and the reader. The hearty meals at Hogwarts and in the Weasley household not look out of place on the tables of the Secret Seven, the Famous Five and the Girls of Mallory Towers. By presenting the familiar and the recognisable, J.K. Rowling draws the readers into a world where the magic seems entirely possible and believable. Newspaper articles come alive before your eyes and characters in pictures move from frame to frame and come and go just as they please. Children are captivated by this imaginary world and it's impossible to overstate the impact that Harry Potter has had on their consciousness. The nothing before or since has captured the global imagination in the same way. Yet the Harry Potter books have been criticised for their lack of ambition in the use of language and ideas. For these critics, Philip Pullman's trilogy, His Dark Materials, is much more satisfying. Lyra Bellacqua and Will Parry travel through parallel worlds and times, crossing the land of the dead and work and fight together to understand the secret of dust. I won't try and explain that to you here. They are helped and hindered by a panoply of people, demons, animals, witches, ghostly and spiritual beings in a dazzling and complex web of encounters that touch and interweave to create a story of astonishing scope. Their amazing books and the ambition of their intellectual and philosophical themes is undeniable but that doesn't mean that they lack heart and warmth. The scene at the beginning of The Subtle Knife, where Will's trying to help his mother, whose mental health has been seriously disturbed, is heartbreakingly moving. And the fate of Roger and his demon is agonising. The moment when Lyra and Will realise what the salvation of the universe means to them personally, is achingly sad. Lyra believed herself to be an orphan and Harry Potter was one and now we're going to look at two of the most famous fictional orphans of all, Heidi and Anne of Green Gables. Heidi by Johanna Spiri was first published in 1881 the five-year-old unwanted little orphan girl is dumped on her grumpy old grandfather by her aunt. The description of Heidi and her grandfather getting to know each other while building her bedroom in the hayloft and having their first meal together of toasted cheese in a bowl of milk while sitting on a three-legged stool is sheer joy to read. Heidi is a happy, friendly little girl who brings joy to the lives of everyone she meets helping them to overcome obstacles along the way in their lives, and she leads her grandfather back from his reclusive life to the village on the Alm. Anne Shirley plays a similar part in transforming the lives of grown-ups around her in Anne of Green Gables by L.M. Montgomery, published in 1908. 
Set on Prince Edward Island in Canada, 11-year-old Anne arrives at the, from the orphanage at the farm of brother and sister Matthew and Marilla Cuthbert. The Cuthberts had wanted a boy to work on the farm and Marilla wants to send the little girl back but Matthew persuades her to let her stay. The development of the relationship between Anne and Marilla and Matthew is touching to read and we watch her grow from fiery tempered redhead to with a strong sense of the dramatic to a helpful young woman who gives up her chance of a scholarship to stay at home with Marilla who'd given her a home and grew to love her. Ellen Montgomery, like Enid Blyton and Eleanor Brent Dyer, had trained as a teacher. Another female teacher went on to write one of the most enduringly popular books of the 19th century and beyond. Little Women was written by Louisa May Alcott in 1868 and the semi-autobiographical stories of the March sisters, Meg, Joe, Beth and Amy, have delighted generations of children to the present day. Joe was the character most resembling Louisa herself. Episodes of books such as the opening scene where Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents and the scene where Joe cuts off her hair and sells it for $25 so that her mother, Marmy, can go to Washington to visit her sick husband. These are among the most memorable and well-loved scenes of any books. Louisa May Alcott was a feminist, a suffragist and an abolitionist and her family actually housed a fugitive slave in 1847. She also served as a nurse during the American Civil War. Another Civil War nurse who went on to write a semi-autobiographical classic girl story was Susan Coolidge, the author of What Katie Did and its sequels. Katie is a headstrong girl, full of good intentions which never seem to work out, whose life's transformed when she is seriously injured in a moment of disobedience. In What Katie Did Next, now, Katie, now aged 21, makes up a serial story for a little girl. Its t title is The History of Violet and Emma. Susan Coolidge describes the story like this. Violet and Emma go to school, come home again, get into scrapes and get out of them, make good resolutions and instantly break them, have Christmas presents and birthday treats, and you find out what they say and how they feel. It could have been called The Adventures of Two Little Girls Who Don't Have Adventures. It seems to me this is intentionally an excellent and unapologetic description of all the stories written by the North American writers and explains their enduring appeal. Their very ordinariness strikes a chord and every reader thinks that they could be Joe Marge or Anne Shirley, or Katie Carr.